can remove all the stuff up to here so far. Welcome everybody to Wednesday Night's Lab. I'm Tom Zinnan. I work here at the UW-Madison Biotechnology Center. I also work for the Division of Extension, Wisconsin 4-H. And on behalf of those folks and our other co-organizers, PBS Wisconsin, the Wisconsin Alumni Association, and the UW-Madison Science Alliance, thanks again for coming to Wednesday Night at the Lab. We do this every Wednesday night by Zoom 50 times a year. Tonight, it's my pleasure to introduce to you John Allen. He's a professor at the University of Illinois in electrical and computer engineering. Um, he's going to be talking with us about his book that he recently published. I first heard about this book uh, at the porch party that my uncle Don, uh, Don Edwards in Dixon, Illinois, organized for many decades. And John was at that porch party and he was talking to me about this book. And I said, wow, would you like to give a talk on it? And he said, wait till it's published. And so he sent me an email a few months ago and I'm delighted to be able to have him come and talk about something that's right at the edge of what I know um, about this much. And so it's gonna be great to hear about the uh, mathematical physics and its history. And so, Professor Allen, uh, I'm going to ask you the five questions. Uh, where were you born? In, in, well, I grew up in Batavia, Illinois, but Del Nor Hospital was, I believe, in St. Charles, which is, I don't know, I was born, but I don't know whether the hospital was in Geneva <laughs> or in St. Charles, but I was born in Del Nor Hospital oh, in Illinois, good... and I used to swim in the Fox River, yep. which was a very polluted thing. It's like, lucky I'm alive. I don't know. Did I answer the question? Yes, you did. Way to go. And then where'd you go to high school? Well, I went to high school. I don't usually admit this, but I went to a private school. My mother went to a private school and then went to Vassar. And so she had high expectations. So I went to the Choate School in Wallingford, Connecticut. Oh it was a goodness. tough haul. And, and then where'd you go for your undergrad? And I went to the University of Illinois, and that was really a luck out because that was a fantastic place to be. And then I went to grad school at the University of Pennsylvania in electrical engineering, but I really dropped electrical engineering. By the time I got my master's, I was just doing physics. I wasn't that interested in electrical engineering. And then when I graduated in 1970, from Penn, I went to Bell Labs and I was there for 32 years in the acoustics research department. And then you transitioned over, uh, I'm assuming you retired from Bell Labs and started up at the University yeah, of Illinois. After, after 32 years at Bell Labs and I started in 1970 and then ended in 2002. And I came to the University of Illinois, which is of course my alma mater yep. for undergraduate. And I've been here ever since. And I'm 77 years old, but I'm still running strong, and I don't have any plans to retire at the moment. Very Tomorrow good. Be different, but well, that's great. Um, so you wrote a book on mathematical physics and its history, and that's what you're going to talk with us about tonight. I'm looking forward to learning lots about stuff I don't know much about. So go ahead and you can start up anytime you'd like. Okay. Can you see my web page here? Yes. That looks good. Models.org, because I spent my career studying the auditory system. Um, am I supposed to? I'm look. I've got. I'm. I'm not seeing myself. I, was, I thought the person who was speaking was supposed to be. The yeah. One. So see what your view is um, on the Zoom thing, and now uh, mine's in the upper right corner, and. Um, I'm you're not seeing yourself because I'm sharing my screen. I may not be. Do you have your uh, video started? We can um, we can see you and we can see you on the YouTube stream. So when I talk, you can see me. Yes. Yep. Thank you. Okay. So I'm just not seeing what you're seeing then, but it's not important that I see myself. I see myself too often as it is. OK, so I'm just going to move that out of the way then. So I'm starting with my web page and the reason for doing that, this is a university web page. They, after I badgered them long enough, they gave me my URL, which I bought a long time ago, auditorymodels.org. 
but it's hosted at the University of Illinois, and it is a University Illinois URL if you dig into the IP address. Now, this is my teaching schedule, and this semester I'm teaching a course in neuroscience, which is new and interesting. Uh, then I teach, and every semester I teach a, what I call the kids version of the book. So the kids version of the book is ECE 298, 200 level course is for juniors and some sophomores. I've had freshmen taking it and I call it complex linear algebra. It's a half semester course and you can go there. You can, this is available on the internet. You go to auditorymodels.org and then you click on this and you'll see that. Now, next semester, I'm teaching the adult version of this course which I teach once a year, Advanced Engineering Mathematics. It's cross-listed as Math 487. And I've taught this at least probably eight times. I haven't counted it. And I've taught the 298 version, the kid kitty version, um, as many times. So that was inspiration for writing the book. And you actually, here's the abridged version of the textbook, which you can download. I think you can download. And um, I'm going to not speak from the abridged version. I'm gonna go to the full, the unabridged version. And I've selected out specific pages. Um, I'm getting lost here. Okay, so that's the kind of the history of what I've been doing with this book. It came out last September and um, it's had 1500 downloads or something like that. The Springer lets me know how it's going. So it's a textbook on mathematical physics, but it's kind of sold to people as a math book. Well, I'll mention this. So this is the introduction. This, this is very, I skip around a lot through the book. I dumped a lot of pages and I just selected out a few pages. And of those pages, I've highlighted some things just that I wanted to make a point of while I'm going through the book. And feel free to ask questions at any time make them specific to what I'm talking about. And, and I'll also answer questions at the end. So as we all know, science has evolved over thousands of years and it began out of curiosity of how things work and people needed to find their way around the world. So they needed instruments to do that. So looking at the stars was a very important indicator of where we were in the universe and where we were on earth and somebody who contributed this contributed to this massively of course was was galileo now he didn't invent the telescope but he sure made use of it and he improved it dramatically so there's but in the process of trying to teach this material, I had to, I generated this Venn diagram that kind of shows you how I think of the problem. Mathematics is very critical to physics and engineering. So physics explores the world and the universe and the state of where we came from and where we're going. Mathematics is a formalization of it. It's a very slow process to formalize the ideas that physics calls upon to explain the universe. And engineering tries to make practical value of this. Now, this is see, a Venn diagram and there are people who are good at mathematics and engineering and people who are good at mathematics and physics and people who are good at engineering and physics. But where you really wanna be is in the sweet spot where you know everything, but there aren't very many people that come from that region. And I mention some of the names of people. Euler is a very obvious choice. And there are quite a few others and I will mention them as we go along, okay? 
there's two distinct ways to learn mathematics in my the way everything i say is my opinion i don't want to have to keep saying in my opinion so by learning definitions or by associating the mathematical concepts with physical reality and i learned mathematics by the latter method i learned mathematics by understanding the physical concepts and then map the mathematics onto it. I did not learn definitions and proofs. For me, that basically wouldn't work. And I tried it and I'm not gonna use the word failed, but I certainly prefer to integrate the mathematics, the physics and the engineering. That does not place me in this region. I don't believe I'm in that region. I'm kind of living in this green region and this blue region and this region over here. And if someday somebody said I lived in this region here, that would be the ultimate compliment, but that's not possible because I'm not good enough at mathematics to do that. But I certainly do love mathematics and I'm enthusiastic about this topic to the point where I wrote the book. Now, this is still the introduction. This is, or the preface, this is foremost a math book, but it's not typical. This book is for the engineering minded and it doesn't have very many proofs. And when I found out I've given a proof, I reword it so that it's not a proof. I'm not interested in making proof. The second is that this is as much a physics book as it is a math book. And I use history to tell a story. Okay, so introduction. So where did math come from? Well, I talk about that. I don't need to lecture to you where it came from. I think you probably know. Euclid wrote a very, very important, important document. And Pythagoras played a very, very important role. The Greeks were interested in this problem, undoubtedly for practical reasons. The Pythagoreans, were a group of people who worked under Pythagoras. They had some strange habits. They lived alone. They were finally burned out. They believed, Pythagoras believed that all is number. And in some sense, this is true. So what is, what's special about numbers? Well, integers are very, very special for a lot of reasons. And they're heavily studied by mathematicians. And one of the reasons they're so important, if not the only reason, is because they're so price, so, so precise. Two is not equal to one. But pi cannot be written down in a finite number of digits because it's an irrational number. Um, we can work, work in logarithmic units, units of semitones or the 12th root of two, which is an approximation to a musical scale. And this is something that I know a fair amount about because I studied it for 30 or 40 years, not semitones, but how the auditory system works. So that's my number one key specialty is the cochlea. How does the cochlea work? What is a mathematical representation of the cochlea? And I really, that's my core, uh, that's my core technology is, is hearing. Now, what is, I, I read Stillwell in this, I'm not willing to quite say that it changed my life, but it certainly educated me. He wrote this wonderful book and it's got a lot of philosophical points of view that I really like. I like his book. I tried to teach out of his book. It was a complete failure, but I got a lot out of it. And there was one point I say in here, I'm not gonna pull that up, but I said, one point I was reading his book and I hit a brick wall and I just couldn't understand what he was talking about. And that's the point at which I wrote this book. And I wrote the book in order to be able to make sure I understood everything that Stillwell was saying up to that point where I hit the brick wall. And I'm ready to go back and pick up his book again and start reading about about the things that I couldn't understand. And I'm sure that I will learn a lot because his book is very articulate, very easy to understand. And he's 
heavily into the history, which is something that I can appreciate. So now I said this book is about history. So how did I do that? I broke out historical periods. We know a lot more about what happened more recently and very little about what happened 5,000 years ago. But we know to some degree of certainty that Babylonia and the Chinese, here's the Pythagoreans, Euclid, Archimedes. I put Caesar here just because people, that's when zero starts, time equals zero starts with Caesar for some strange reason, not that strange. Diophantus, Brahma Gupta, I mentioned all these people, Bacasarar, Karar, Leonardo, Da Vinci, Bombelli is a very interesting character. I'll explain what that's all about. And this is where algebra came from. Copernicus, you all know. Marco Polo is there because people know who he is. And I just like to put him on the scale because I have a few anchors like Caesar and Leonardo and Bombelli I'm going to have to explain. So this is just getting started. I certainly have left off a lot of names, but this is, you know, priming the pump, the history pump. And so there's this interesting guy by the name of Needham who fell in love with a Chinese woman and made some very deep insights into China. And so I quote a little story about that. And here we go back to Bombelli. So what in the world did Bomb? You've never heard of Bombelli. I can almost be sure of that. Bombelli, well, we have to go back a little bit first. There's a book by Diophantus, which is after Euclid. Euclid, of course, wrote about geometry and he he's very obviously a brilliant mathematician, but he didn't generate a lot of the ideas. He just documented what was known at the time and he did a really good job of it. Diophantus is much later, looks like 500 years. The exact times are, are quoted in some, some other figures that I'm not showing. Diophantus is known. There's something called Diophantine calculus or Diophantine arithmetic, Diophantine mathematics. And it's the mathematics where you try to, the solutions are all integer solutions of equations. So you could have a quadratic equation and say, what are the integer solutions of that equation? You can have something called Pythagorean triplets. So C squared is equal to A squared plus B squared, where A, B, and C are integers. And these problems were attacked in a very creative way by Diophantus. And he wrote quite a few books, according to Stilwell, who just digging it out of the literature, it's well known. But nobody had any copies of that book. And then this guy, Bombelli, was looking through the Vatican Library, and he found Diophantus's book. And that caused an explosion. Galileo read it. Galileo read it. Descartes read it, Fermat, Newton, everybody was reading that book. That's a train going by my house. You'll have to excuse the. I Is that an Amtrak? Inside. Is that the Amtrak train going by? not very long. They deliver corn down the road. You're going to pick up a load of corn probably. All right. This one's looking like a long one. I don't know. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Um, okay, it's over. Sorry about that. It's kind of quaint. It's all down. I kind of like the train. So lost my train of thought, but this shows an important period in time. And it started with this guy, Bombelli. Not that he played a role, he's just kind of a pawn in the game. He discovered Francis's book and that, that triggered a whole bunch of very, these are famous names in mathematics and they're famous because they read Diophantus's book. Bernoulli, very, a whole family, which I'll talk about later, amazing. They hated each other. There's three mathematicians, Bernoulli, and they were 
deepest of enemies. And then Gauss, who is kind of a charming figure. Um, but the real key to this is Euler and Cauchy and D'Alembert and Lagrange and, of course, Newton and many others. Okay, so I don't claim to have a deep, deep knowledge about this, but this is a superficial but important portrait of what these people had to say. Okay, so here's some pictures of uh, Jacob and Johann Bernoulli. I don't have a picture of Daniel. Daniel is the son of Johann. Jacob is a true. These guys are horrible. They, they're just the pits. And Euler is a student. He's blind in one eye, which he always has his portrait to the side. His good eye shows. I guess the bad eye probably was glass eye or something. So Johann was a student taught two people. One, so he, so Johann learned mathematics from Jacob, and then he went on and taught it to his son Daniel Bernoulli, who was the third Bernoulli, and he also taught Euler, Euler, and Euler just went bananas. He he outstripped them all. And then there's this guy D'Alembert who played a very very important role, and I, I like to highlight him. Just like I got these these pictures from they're in Stillwell's book and I really like them. So now moving on a little bit more with the history, we go from Bombelli. This is going out to, to World War II. I've got Lincoln and Mozart here and Napoleon. But the rest of the people I believe are all mathematicians or famous scientists such as Maxwell, Hilbert, Cauchy, Johann Bernoulli, Euler, this vertical red line means these people are connected. So Johann, here's Daniel down here. I didn't connect him to Johann. I probably should have done that, but I didn't think of it because he was such a nasty person. Johann was no delight either. Johann Stoll, Daniel Bernoulli is probably the more famous today because he developed fluid mechanics and then his father tried to steal it from him. But you want Yo, Euclid, sorry, Euler just outstripped them all in terms of his publication record. He's far more important, in my opinion, than Gauss, but I never really heard much about Euler when we always heard about Gauss because he was kind of an amazing guy. For example, he generated 300, 3 million prime numbers in his quote, spare time, unquote. And they've gone back to check, and those are largely correct his lists and he then he published work his his output in my opinion isn't that significant when you compare him for example to Euler but I could be wrong and it doesn't make any difference he's as famous as you can get who's more famous Gauss or Einstein well today probably Einstein or Maxwell Maxwell's not that well known by the populace Rayleigh he's a critical person. Cauchy, these are people that I really cover heavily in the book. Helmholtz, amazing, amazing guy. Abraham Lincoln. I had Civil War and they made me take it out. So I put Lincoln in there as a snapshot personality. So most people know him. So you could read about Euler, what I have to say about him. And then this talks about the organization of the book. So I got the idea from a mathematician, I'll put quotes around the word friend because he was pretty aggressive with me and very outspoken and loved to tell me I was wrong about everything, but I'd still call him a friend. And I went to him at one point and said, I'm gonna thinking about writing this book and I have this Stillwall thing and it's got these three streams. Stillwall identifies three streams in mathematics, the three great streams of mathematical thought numbers, geometry, and infinity. And so my friend, he'll go unnamed, but you can figure out by looking at the, at my, you can't, it's not hard to figure out who he was. Anyway, um, these three streams, I was, it was suggested by, I'll just call him John. John says, 
why don't you follow up on these three streams and organize your book around that? And the words were no longer out of his mouth that I said, that's exactly what I'm going to do. So I have basically three sections. Number theory, which I didn't know anything about, but I do, I know enough to be dangerous. And geometry and infinity is calculus. So that's the organization of the book. I was thinking I would put the table of contents up, but I forgot to do that. But you can look at the table of contents. It's online. It's freely available from, from uh, Springer. So these three streams, there's a chapter, the introduction. The number systems is chapter two. That's stream one. And then stream, then algebraic equations is stream two, that's geometry. And then stream three is differential equations. So here's the breakdown of the three streams. This is chapter two, numbers. I don't know why that's not selecting. Um, and then I guess this was turned into a figure and I can't select it. Geometry and infinity, okay? So differential equations is infinity. Geometry is working with polynomials and fundamental theorem of algebra and numbers is characterizing numbers such as counting numbers, irrational numbers, prime numbers, integers, here's irrational numbers, um, and et cetera. I'll talk a little bit about these, but I don't need to develop on it. Well, right, right here it is. So the taxonomy of numbers. This is actually quite interesting. So here's in, in throughout the book, there's these exercises that I generated. An exercise means it comes with the solution. Write the first 20 integers in prime factored form. So one is one, two is two, three is three. Four is two squared, five is five. Six is two times three, seven is a prime. Eight is three squared. Nine is two, three, eight, I can't read. Eight is two square cubed. Nine is three squared. So anyway, here's the solution. So I've written, written it out here. So if n is two, then it's pi two. Pi two is the prime sub two. It's two. And the third prime is three. The fourth prime is five. For, the fourth prime is seven. The 11th prime is 31. So I've written it out in factored form. So 10 would be pi one times pi three, pi one is two, pi three is five, two times five is 10, so there you go. So this is actually kind of amazing and it was known from the very, very beginning. This was not a recent suggestion, fundamental theorem of arithmetic. Now there's a bunch of definitions here, I'm not gonna go into them, but co-primes, you could think of generalizations of these ideas like tri primes and the integers are counting numbers with negative integers and zeros added so n is just the number the counting numbers from 1 to infinity and then all of the integers include the negative numbers plus 0 0 is not included in the integers i guess that's what I, I'm surprised they didn't say that here, but I should say it later. <clears throat> okay, so the natural numbers, I prefer to call them the natural numbers because they're the counting numbers and you can have negative natural numbers, zero and positive natural numbers, but N is defined as one to infinity integers. And then there's rational numbers and I got in trouble with a reviewer I said that three over one was not a rational number because, well, that was obvious to me, but I was completely wrong. And he took great glee in pointing out my error. So I invented fractional numbers, which are the ones that I really think are far more important. And this is my opinion. I don't need to say it's my opinion because everything in the book is my opinion. So rational numbers are really not that interesting because three over one is one, I would, I'd rather talk about fractional numbers that are ratios of primes. That would be a special case of fractional numbers that's very interesting. And then you can factor every number into fractional numbers. 
because every integer is the product of primes. And so you could write that as the ratios of ratios of primes. And, and that was a nice expansion. I'm not sure who does it and when they do it and how they do it, but I'm happy to think about it. And then I said, okay, you take fractional numbers plus the ir irrationals and that gives you um, the set of all integers plus, well, I'm not sure what I'm saying here. But anyway, I worked out the hierarchy of all of these things. And I think it is, must be later on a few pages down. Um, also, I talk about two by two matrices, which play a major role in the book. So people are sometimes confused. Or they don't understand complex numbers. It's very interesting. You don't need to use the square root of minus one to, to, to define complex numbers. You just say any number with, an, a, with a number a plus b times j, where j is the square root of minus one, can be written as a two by two matrix in this form. And then you can define one and j as those things, and you can find e to the j theta. And you can completely avoid using the square root of minus one. If it offends you in some way, then just go to two by two matrices and work there. You can work that two by two matrix algebra and everything works perfectly. So you can divide two complex numbers by each other. So this puts complex numbers on a different scale. It's a two by two matrix and you use standard matrix algebra and everything works just fine. That's interesting. Well, the history of complex numbers is quite interesting because nobody believed in them, especially especially Newton. He called them imaginary numbers. When he got to a complex number, he ignored it. That's the way to deal with a complex number. Today, of course, life is quite different. And you can write out, this is something I was thinking about saying, but I haven't gotten here yet. So here's a hierarchy of numbers. You can start off with the prime numbers. They're the most fundamentals. And they're upset they're in the set of primes, which is in the set of counting numbers, which is in the set of integers, which are plus and minus counting numbers and zero, which is in the set of rationals, of, ir, of, in the, of rationals. Wait a minute, um, Q is irrationals, I think. Q, here's the irrationals. Um, so we have, anyway, I don't wanna get into it because it's not that important. And then you get the reals and finally you get the complex. So complex is the most general kind of number. And this is a scale, it goes from primes all the way up to complex numbers. And it's really quite helpful to think about these numbers this way. And I've got some subsets in there if you Take the union of the of the um, counting numbers plus and minus and zero along with the fractionals. You get the you get the rationals, and if you take the rationals and the irrationals, you get the reals, and they're all a subset. So this is stuff that Gauss really understood at a deep level. Any questions so far? I'm doing too much talking. Some Somebody say something. So how did Gauss come up with his plume? How did Gauss come up with what? His Gaussian plume. His Gaussian plume? Yeah, that's what, the only thing I ever heard about Gauss was modeling uh, airflow. So that might not be what it is. So we'll move on. <laughs> um, I... I, I will make a comment about that later, if I remember. All right. Sorry about that. So um, you can look that up on the internet and see if it really is a Gaussian plume. There's, well, let me go on. I can't answer your question. So how do you find the primes? That's called, um, this goes back to Aristosthenes, who ran the library um, in, uh, in Egypt where all the books were kept. Every time a ship would come into the harbor, 
they'd steal all the books and all night long the the um, people would copy the books. They probably gave the copy back to the owner and they kept the originals. So they had this amazing library and it was burned down by pirates or somebody because it was so powerful. They were collecting information about the world, all of these travel records, travel logs. They were built, Aristosthenes built the first map of the world and it was reasonably accurate to the extent that they'd sailed it. So how do you make primes? So you use a sieve. So you take, you start with two, it's a prime, and you cross out all of the multiples of it. So you cross out two times two, three times two, four times two. And that leaves three and five and seven, but the first non-prime that it's left is that. So now you make all the multiples of three. Well, that gets rid of nine, and 15 and 21 and 27, 39, 45, etc. You got 19 on here, which is a prime. You got 23, it's a prime. 25 is not a prime. So we're going to take the next prime, five, and multiply it by all of the multiples. One times five is five. Two times five is 10. We're going to, we got 10 already. Then we're going to get, so I don't need to go on. This is a very, very important construction. You have to start with how many primes. So Apparently, this is exactly what Gauss did. Gauss took three million numbers and did this calculation. And this thing converges very rapidly. You can imagine, you can see how when you're just up to multiples of three, then you don't have multiples of five. The first number is 25. So this thing really goes like a, a banshee out of hell and it's good. So. That's how the only way I know actually to get primes other than going to MATLAB and asking if a number is a prime and 3 million primes in MATLAB takes less than a second to compute. I think Gauss would probably be unhappy about that, but actually I'm not gonna go on about that because you could just compute all the primes you want and store them so you never need to compute them again. And then if you need more primes, you just compute more of them. So using a sieve. So uh, then there's some really interesting mathematics. Like, can you solve the problem? Find M and M such that 12M plus 15N is equal to one. Well, that has a solution. It's called the Euclidean algorithm. This is a really important fundamental piece of piece of mathematics that I'd never heard about and I studied it and occasionally I understood it and every now and then I go back and refresh my memory but this is a linear system of equations with integers so this is a Diophantian equation find an integer solution to this linear relationship between two integers m and n and two other m integers 12 and 15, and they have to be equal to one. So how do you do that? Well, there's a way. And another very important thing are called continued fractions. So you take a number, typically can be any number, can be irrational, can be fractional, can be irrational. Let's take the number pi. So we take the integer part of it, so 3.14, so the integer part is three. So we put three here and we take the remainder is 0.1416 and we take its reciprocal. Well, the reciprocal of 0.14 is seven. So the next number is seven. So we can just truncate the thing at that point and we can say it's equal to three plus one over seven and that gives 22 sevenths, which is an incredibly good approximation to pi. So it's got an order of like one in a thousand. And you take it the next term, you get 16, and that's good to one in 10 to the seventh. 2.7 times 10 to the seventh. You take the next term and it's minus 249, which now this is doing something strange because it's not taking the integer, it's taking the floor. In other words, it's rounding it's finding the nearest rounded number and that's why it comes up with a negative number. But that's good to 10 to the minus 10th. So this, these are two examples of incredibly important early calculations done by 
Diophantus and others that have survived history as some of the most important computations in integer arithmetic. And there is a lot to learn from these things. And they generalize to polynomials. You can use, you can use fractional approximations on a polynomials and you can, there's just amazing stuff that comes out of this. This is how amazing it is. In, there's a clay tablet that was found or bought by Plimpton who was, I don't know, he's, he is a collector, he has a lot of money. 1922, he collected these clay tablets and these numbers were written on the clay tablet. And this is A and this is C. And so you can take C squared minus A squared and take the square root of it and it'll always be an integer except for the few mistakes. But this proves that this clay tablet from Babylonia, which was, you know, in, you know, prehistoric times, <coughs> it shows that they knew, <coughs> at least approximately, they knew about Pythagorean triplets, which I'll show you the proof of Pythagorean triplets if I ever get there. So this is also important to the, Pythag to the um, Pythagoreans because they wanted to show that the square root of two was a rational number. In other words, it was the ratio of two integers, but instead they proved <laughs> that it wasn't rational. They proved that it was irrational, which was very disturbing. And some guy leaked, one of the Pythagoreans leaked this piece of information. So they took him out in the back lot and killed him. And this follows trivially from the solution of this equation. And you take the ratio of two and that approaches the square root of two, and this is a well-known result. And you can read about it in Stillwell, which is where I learned about it. So <clears throat> here's the solution to Pell's equation for n equals two. You just have to iterate this two by two matrix equation and the eigenvalues of this equation, powers of the eigenvalues are the solutions and you can iterate that thing all day long so you start off with X and Y being one and zero, and then one, one, zero, one. This is, this is a different equation. I was talking before about Pell's equation. There's the matrix for Pell's equation. Here's a different thing called Fibonacci, which everybody seems to know about. The next number is the sum of the two previous numbers. So this is what this equation says, that X sub N is equal to X naught plus Y naught. And y naught replaces x naught, so y, y1 is equal to x naught. So you just bump the previous value to the next position, and then you add the two together, and that gives you the next one in the series, and it's very easy to show the Pythagorean triplet, the Pythagorean integers are <coughs> generated by this two by two matrix. And the solutions to Pell's equation are generated by this matrix recursion and the ratio of X over Y at any index N is a better approximation of the square root of N. So this is how the Pythagoreans proved to their satisfaction that the square root of any number is, this, this is actually a pretty long story, but I start my course pressing the idea that you can do all this algebra with two by two matrices. And in general, you can do it by n by n matrices. And <clears throat> for every matrix that has an, every matrix has eigenvalues and those eigenvalues are equal to the characteristic polynomial of a differential equation. So a differential equation is similar to a Fibonacci series it says the next value is equal to the sum of the previous two. That's the characteristic function of a Fibonacci series. You can write a differential equation, constant coefficient differential equation, substitute e to the j omega, e to the lambda t, and you can get a characteristic polynomial, which has roots. And then you can take that characteristic polynomial and that roots, and you can generate an n by n matrix, which is called... <clears throat> 
um, what is it called? It's called the companion matrix. And I have to admit, I'd never heard of the companion matrix until I wrote the book, but the companion matrix should be on page one of every linear algebra book. But I, so far I haven't found it in any of the linear algebra books. Well, that's not quite true. <clears throat> companion matrix is a matrix whose eigenvalues are equal to the, the characteristic equation of the differential equation. So that plays a very, very important role. And that's talked about in the book, but I'm not gonna talk about it any further. So I seem to be into the history, but I'm just showing you the history part. There's a lot of math in the book as well. Now I'm really reaching out to the 1950s, which is about as far as I'm gonna go. And you can see, this is very interesting because Newton triggered the Bernoullis and Euler, D'Alembert. This is Landmarks, Mozart and, Be Mozart and Beethoven, just because you know those people. And Cauchy is a contemporary of Gauss. Gauss had a very long life. And after Gauss, all these names followed. Well, did they follow because of Gauss or did they follow because of Cauchy? In my opinion, they followed because of Cauchy, not because of Gauss. Gauss did plenty of things. He's very famous. We don't need to stroke him at all. He's gotten more strokes than he possibly deserves. I'm not sure that's true. It's my opinion. And here's Cauchy. And Cauchy did some really fundamental thin things. And Cauchy had all of the insights of D'Alembert, Daniel Bernoulli, Newton, so did Gauss, but Cauchy turned the crank. And then we had Stokes, Helmholtz, Kirchhoff, Kelvin, Riemann, Maxwell, Rayleigh, Heaviside, Poincaré. That's the brick wall that I ran into. And then Sonnenfeld, who is the most famous mathematical physicist, in my opinion, that ever lived. Stein and Brioan who you probably have heard of because of Brioan zones. Brioan is another super, super guy. He's connected to Sommerfeld. So I think seeing how this is laid out and who did what and when and understanding what Maxwell, what was Maxwell's role relative to Riemann? What did Riemann do? Why is Kirchhoff on this scale? If you understand what these people did, you will understand mathematical physics. You don't need to go any further. This is it. This is putting, putting um, a harness around the field by studying what each of these individuals did. And it's all described by both in my book and of course in Stillwell. You'll come out of this knowing a hundred times, if not a thousand times, depends on how much math you started with, but you can learn mathematics really, really well by understanding what the physics was behind the math, because the, the physics drove the mathematics. Now, if you ask a mathematician, they won't tell you that. They think it's the other way around many times, but <clears throat> I believe that it's my opinion. And a lot of it started with Galileo and Bra. Paco, Paco Bra had a brass or iron nose that he wore because his nose was cut off in a duel. Anyway, even if you <clears throat> there's something you disagree that I said, it's fascinating to read about these stories. And Galileo, <laughs> it is said, and I think it's true, that Galileo's third finger is raised and it's in a Trevine, a, a glass case. They cut off his hand and they put his finger in there and he's giving <laughs> the finger to the Catholic church. Even though he was good friends with the Pope, they treated him very well, except they house arrested him. Instead of burning him at the stake, they only house arrested him, so he got off easy. Any more questions? So what's the state today with um, on the cool physics in uh, our lifetimes, cool physical math and physics? Well, we're moving on. All right. That's going to be in later chapters. 
I'm already used up my hour. See, I have seven minutes. Yep. Um, so I'm going to have to. So I get into polynomials and I talk about Newton's method. And I say that Newton's method, which is given here, you have a polynomial and its derivative. This will always give you the roots of the polynomial. But there are many books that say Newton's method doesn't always converge. Well, that's just not true. They just don't know what Newton's method is. So here's some examples where I start with random roots. The roots are up here and here's some other roots. And I started with a random trial and it always, and there's a region of convergence, which is really amazing. Like there's this little teeny valley that if you start in this region, it'll always converge to that root. And if you start over here, it converges to that root. And I understand how this all works. This is actually very cool. And it has to do with something called the Gauss-Lucas theorem. So the roots of the derivative of a polynomial are bounded by the Gauss-Lucas theorem. And that's why Newton's method works. And this is the reciprocal of the logarithmic derivative. This is actually extremely interesting just in its own. You can always find the roots of any polynomial by applying this method may not end up with the one. If you start here, you can end up at that root, but it always converges. If you take small enough step sizes, it always works. So that's all explained here. <clears throat> Gauss-Lucas theorem, fantastic theorem. Now I'm switching topics here. There's something we all have learned in school that called the scalar product or the so-called dot product. You dot, have two vectors and you dot A against B. And that's equal to the magnitude of A times the magnitude of B times the cosine of the angle between them. Well, that's okay. But it's only half of the story because there's also, instead of putting the cosine here, you can put the sine there. And this is called the wedge product. So A wedge B is perpendicular to the plane defined by A and B. It's perpendicular to that. And if you add these two together with J, you can get something which I call the, the generalized product, the generalized scalar product, because this is a scalar, but you've got the dot product, the scalar product with the cosine, you've got the wedge product with the sine, and you put J on there, so it's equal to this. This has huge implications that are, this turns out that Schwartz inequality is, is a hoax. I shouldn't have said that, but there's a, Schwartz inequality is not an analytic result. And when you use this result, you can apply it to something like the pointing theorem from Maxwell's equations. And you've got E dot H plus J times E wedge H, and that's the pointing theorem. Um, and it's a complex thing. It's including the phase, not just the power. It's complex analytic. Theta is a complex analytic representation, whereas A dot B is not complex an analytic. And here's another example. So the momentum equation, which is D wedge B, is D dot B plus J times D wedge B, which is pointing vector divided by C squared. Well, that looks sort of like equals mc squared. You got the energy is equal to the momentum times c squared. Well, I don't think that's an accident. Here's the derivation of the Pythagorean triplets. I'm not going to go into this, but you, what you do is you take a tangent, not a tangent, a sec, whatever this is called. So you start, you make a straight line whose slope is t and it starts at this point, you have a unit circle and it's intersects the circle at A comma B. And then you make T a rational number. And so now you can just write down what the answer is. It says that A square, A is B. So you have two integers, P and Q, and A is equal to P squared minus Q squared and B is equal to two PQ. Then C is equal to P squared plus Q squared. Try it, it works. So this is the Pythag this gives you the Pythagorean triplets. So you can take any two integers, p and q, typically p is bigger than q, and this is b, this is a, this is c, and it works. This was known by, obviously by Euclid. Um, it 
it's called Euclid's formula. Well, that's kind of cool. So this is an infinite number of Pythagorean triplets. And I'm going to show you something I think later should be now. There's something called the Rydberg atom. I'm just going to jump right to that because it's so important and we're on this point. Um, so this is much, this is an appendix of my book. There's something called Rydberg atoms and the hydrogen is a Rydberg atom, quantum mechanics and the when. So what's the equation for, so this was observed very early that the, the, the spectrum of hydrogen and of the Rydberg atoms all obey this thing, this formula, which is now called the Rydberg formula. It says that the frequencies are proportional to one over an integer squared minus one over another integer squared. And the wavelength, the reciprocal wavelengths are related to the frequencies. And what is N and M? Well, N and M correspond to the jump of the electron, if you want to call it that, because it's in an evanescent state. But the electrons are going around the proton and they have these eigenstates and they jump from one to the next. So 122 nanometers is the first eigenstate that jumps from N equals one to N equals two. And you can label all of these things. And this is called the Lyman series, the Balmer series, the Passion series. And all these atoms obey this thing. And so now you can study what the heck is going on. And you can actually make some progress on that, which is what I did. So we know that E equals H nu, but now we also know this other formula for the Rydberg. What is, what's the physical implication of the Rydberg formula? And my answer to that is not only is energy conserved inside this atom, we know that's true, but momentum is conserved. So when, a, when a, an evanescent electron jumps from one state to the next, momentum and energy are conserved. And that's this formula is a very, very special, you can't come up with some other formula. It has to be this formula or else you're not satisfying energy and momentum. So I jumped way ahead in this story to this because I was talking, I don't know what page I was on. I should have figured out what page I was on. Let's go back to page 20. And you can stop me at any time because I just hit one hour. But as long as I'm entertaining you, we can keep going. So there's, this is where I was. I was on page 23, which in the book is page 116. It's about 300 pages in the book, something less than that maybe. So this extension of the dot product to include the wedge product and make a complex analytic function has major implications. One place is the Schwartz inequality, which I talk about in the book. And here I talk about the generalized scalar product. They call it a scalar product because if you take a dot product, that's a scalar. If you take a wedge product, that's a scalar. And then this is complex analytic scalar product. And that's obviously got some important implications and I can't say exactly what they are, but I certainly have some opinions. But this is known way back when, how to generate Pythagorean triplets. And they're relevant to the hydrogen atom and the Rydberg, all the Rydberg atoms. And the proof is simple and well understood. And this is a good place for me to take a break. And I'm gonna get into some physics now, drop the history and I'm happy if anybody has a question or if you're sleeping, tell me that you're going to wake up because I'm going to change topics. Well, that would be great. Um, uh, like I say, this, uh, uh, I know nothing about what's going on now um, in the areas of electrical engineering and uh, so let me just go a few more, few more minutes. Let's say I'm going to go for five at most eight minutes and okay. give you some thoughts on what's going on. Now I'm out of the math and I'm no longer talking about integer arithmetic. I'm talking about differential equations. So, the, you know, electrical and I'm going to unify electrical engineering, mechanics, acoustics. There's two kinds of acoustics and 
thermodynamics. And this is kind of amazing that these things are all exactly the same. If you understand Ohm's law and how to deal with voltage and current in complex impedance Z, which is the gradient of the voltage divided by the current, and this is a complex function called an impedance. And the real part of the impedance has to be real, otherwise it doesn't satisfy conservation of energy. If you understand that, then you also understand Newton's laws, but you've generalized them, the force and velocity, because the impedance, the mechanical impedance, is the ratio of the gradient of, we're going to call it a force, divided by the velocity. Acoustics is a better example. It's the force is the pressure, and the velocity is called the particle velocity. And there's another kind of acoustics where you have the mean pressure and the volume velocity. And all of these things are exactly, literally, the math is identical. And then what kind of shocked me is that thermodynamics is also exactly the same. And I have, I'm going to jump ahead. I'm on page 26. Remind me what page number I'm on. Because um, I want to say something about thermodynamics, which, as far as I know, hasn't been said before as clearly as I'm going to say it. I hope that's true. Again, my opinion. <clears throat> so there's a an appendix here about thermodynamics, and it's very short. It's only a few pages long. Some of the most interesting results in the book are in these appendices, not appendix, of thermodynamic systems. So appendix E, many people find thermodynamics difficult to understand. When I say that to my class, no matter how big it is, everybody nods their head yes. Oh yes, we agree completely. They don't understand thermodynamics. And I say here, here we are going to explore the reasons behind this lack of transparency and propose a solution. Now, when I tell, when I say this to somebody who does thermodynamics for a living, they don't want to hear what I have to say because they spent their life learning thermodynamics and they got it and they just must think I'm nuts. They don't get it. Thermodynamics is so difficult to understand. So here's the explanation. Thermodynamics, oops, I'm, I jumped, I did something terrible. I, I'm on page, oh, here it is. Summary of thermodynamic relationships. So if you go, so thermodynamics was really one of the first sciences to be studied, was really developed pretty early. And it was a mathematical science. So you have the internal energy, you have the specific empathy, empathy, enthalpy, enthalpy. You have the Gibbs free energy and the Gibbs function. Now look at these, they're all energies. You have the internal energy, what's that? Well, that's the heat energy. And you have the pressure times the volume velocity or particle velocity, that's a specific enthalpy. Then you have the Helmholtz free energy, that's the internal energy minus the temperature times the entropy. What's the entropy? Well, the entropy is the current. The entropy is like charge. Temperature is like the voltage and S is like the charge if you're thinking of an electrical case. And then the Gibbs energy is another combination of these things. So why is it hard to understand? Well, it's working with nonlinear equations. P times V, T times S, and they don't do it in a particularly rational way but they justify it because they've got a lot of famous names and there's all these relationships and it's pretty hard to understand actually. But at this point, I got it. And I explain it here in the book, in this appendix. And I said I was on page 29, right? 26. You're on 26. So here we are. Electricity, the potential is the voltage. In thermodynamics, the potential is the temperature. So think when you think of voltage or you think of temperature, think voltage. The current 
in electricity is the same as the entropy rate. This is a mistake. That should be the time rate of change of entropy because the current is the time rate of change of charge. So if you want to define an impedance, you have to define the gradient and the temperature divided by the entropy rate, the time derivative of the entropy. <clears throat> then this thing turns out to be virtually identical to all these other cases. And you can stop saying, I don't understand this problem because all of a sudden it becomes really, really simple. It's just like Ohm's law. And if I show this to a thermodynamicist, they want to kick me down the stairs. That's my feeling of how they behave about it. But if you know electrical engineering and you know voltage and current and you know, or you know acoustics, if you know any of these fields, you can just turn it over and bingo, you can understand thermodynamics. And the reason why thermodynamics is difficult because it's been formulated as an energy, not a power, but an energy. And that's a nonlinear relationship. Energy, the voltage times the current is the integral. That's a nonlinear relationship. Don't work with nonlinear relationship. Linear ones. Now, I've taken my extra 10 minutes. And if you allow me to tell you what a Fourier transform is, I'll go a couple more minutes, but I, I'm starting to feel guilty that I should stop. Well, um, if we can see if anybody has questions, because I think people, um, since it's 8, 10 already, they may need to peel off. And if I can see if people have questions, um, there might be some in the chat. Bia, do you see anything there that's... Um... Yes, I do. Okay. Um, First, Sandy put in the chat. Um, he's wondering if you ever read this book. I don't know if you can see the ch chat, um, John, but this book is from Oliver Heaviside. Heaviside. Um, oh, and sure, it's The yes, Life, Work, and Times of an Electrical Genius by the Victorian Age by, oh, by Paul J. Nahin. Yes, that's a very, very good book. Yes, I and, read it. And then the second question in the chat that's is- not a question. Oh, do I, yeah, am sorry, I aware of the it. book? I'm absolutely aware of the book. Um, the second question is from Raj. Um, is there a pi matrix where every row and column is pi? And is this an infinite matrix? And does it have any application? What do you mean by a pi matrix? Raj, if you're still there, if you want to come on and... Uh... Uh, what, I, what I want to say was, if... If you have any kind of a modeling of uh, some physical system, I don't know. And if they can be represented as series of columns and uh, rows, and if it so happened that they are all pi, and when you start uh, you know, making matrix uh, manipulation, uh, is there any kind of a problem that you can describe of such a, uh, such a possible existence of Pi is occupying all rows and all columns. And do you call it as an infinite matri matrix because pi itself is an infinite series? So can we call it as an infinite matrix or does it, isn't, does, it doesn't make sense? So the problem with what you're saying is that pi is not anything special. There's an infinite number of irrational numbers, and pi just happens to be one of them. E is another irrational number. The square root of two is irrational. Square root of three, square root of four, square root of five, they're all irrational numbers. Square root of four is not irrational. <laughs> but there's an infinite number. If you take the square root of a, of a prime, you're gonna get an irrational number. I think that's true. So you're bringing up an infinite matrix of pi's how about an infinite matrix of any other irrational number? You really need to expand your view to think about irrational numbers. How dense are the irrational numbers on the real line? So I talked a little bit about the construction of the real line. You start with the primes and then you, you go to you know, the integers, the negative integers, and you can build up fractionals, irrational numbers. And this was all carefully studied and it's kind of kind of an interesting history because the guy who studied it went crazy and he was put down, but today he's recognized. So 
it's it's a complicated area. I think there's still room for improvement, understanding the different kinds of irrational numbers. Of course, that's what the Pythagoreans started with. They wanted, they wanted to believe that everything was integer, that all numbers were fractionals or rational, and it just wasn't true. And when they discovered that, it was kind of the end of them. They were in very, they didn't know what to do about it. And they were soon dissolved and the plantation was burned down and they all were killed. So I don't know if I answered your question, but it's the best I can do. Expand, yeah. your, expand your thought to all irrational numbers, not just pi. All right, B, if you'd like to do the next one. Um, this one is also from Sandy about the same book. He put in a few different books and links. And then it looks like the next comment in the chat is from Jim, um, kind of putting a little more to your, um, your answer to Raj. But that's all I have in the chat right now for questions. So what did he say about Raj's question? Um, Jim says, Raj, I don't know about the matrix question, but pi is trans, transcendental, transcendental. Yeah. So they have different ways of generating irrational numbers and there's a categorization system for doing this. Um, and I don't know a lot about it, but one thing that I cover pretty carefully in my book is when you compute on a computer, you cannot represent an irrational number because it's an infinite number of, it's an infinite sequence of numbers. You can write a formula for finding pi to as many digits as you want that was done by Ramanujan and others, but you can't ever put an irrational number into a computer. Now, when I said that to my mathematical friend, he did very predictably, he said I was crazy. I didn't know what I was talking about. So <laughs> I don't know what to say. Um, I've definitely created a few, um, generated a few opinions coming out of the woodwork with some of the things that I say, but I come at mathematics from the physical principles. So that's the best I can do with that one. Think about all irrational numbers. There's categories of them. They're fascinating, but they're unlimited numbers. How, how, if you wrote, what's the density of irrational numbers on the real line? Yep, I don't know that one either. <laughs> yeah, well, so I, let me just say one or two things, just take a couple of minutes. So you can understand a Fourier transform because it's a dot product. And the thing is that there's different kinds of thing you're taking Fourier transforms of like integers, discrete periodic signals. And so the reason why a Fourier transform is complicated because they have different dot products you have a periodic sequence that's called a Fourier series. So that's pretty clear. Then I've got this whole section that I'm not going to talk about, about representations of complex analytic functions. <clears throat> this is an exponential. This is the inverse of it. Branch cuts. This gets into Riemann's work. So Riemann, Bernard Riemann explains what the point at infinity is. It's just another number. It could be infinite, it could be whatever, but he's got a mapping from a sphere onto the plane. And when the point on the plane goes to infinity, the point on the sphere goes to the North Pole. So the sphere is the closed plane and the plane is the open plane. That's a very cool piece of work. And so I show some stuff about that kind of thing. And I give a specific example of the square root of two, square root of S. You have branch cuts, you have, here's a, this is a function that's, um, this, this function is multi-valued, this functional is sing, single-valued. How do you deal with the multi-valued functions and what's a branch cut? Talk a lot about that. And here's a function that's much more interesting. It's this one over the square root of S, which is an impedance because it's real over here. So <clears throat> there really are impedances that are irrational, one over the square root of S. And the most important function in the whole world is this um, Riemann zeta function, which was really invented by Euclid, excuse me, Euler, 
and I can't talk about that because it takes too long, but here's complex analytic mapping of the cosine of pi z and the Bessel function j naught. You see they're very, very similar, except the zeros have been pushed out away from the origin. But a Bessel function j naught zero is just like a cosine, except it's on a distorted plane. And here, this is, this is not always true. Here's a j naught Bessel function versus a Hankel function. It's got this branch cut in there. This is a solution of a wave equation. It's spherical co cylindrical coordinates. And then we get into vector calculus and I'm gonna stop here after one more very cute thing that I'm quite proud of. So in vector calculus, we have the gradient, the divergence, the Laplacian. I define something called the wedgie, which instead of the dot product is the wedge product, the curl well-known. And I gave a name to the Laplacian and I call it God because a gradient of the divergence. The gradient of the divergence is G-O-D, God. And then there's bulldog. That is the divergence of the gradient. So that's D-O-G. And then there's the curl of the curl. So we call that Coke, C-O-C. And it's got this identity. The curl of the curl is equal to, it's equal to God minus Bulldog. And the divergence of the curl, that's doc. And doc and cog are both zero. That's called Helmholtz theorem. So doc and cog are null operators. And this is the source of one of the most fundamental theorems in mathematics, the fundamental theorem of vector calculus, which was created by, so I kind of and you know, talk about this a little bit and the generalizations of Oblastian in terms of this function. I got one more thing I want to say and I'll stop. And so, then, uh, oh, okay. This plot came out of a book by Harry Olson from 1947. He was, he was head of the research lab at RCA Victor and they were interested in building horns and the horns were the source of the Victrola player. And so he is very mathematically talented and he looked at the real and the imaginary part of the input impedance of a horn and something amazing happens that for an exponential horn and derivatives of the exponential horn, the real part of the impedance abruptly goes to zero. And this is easy to prove and the, so the dashed lines of the imaginary part and the solid lines of the real parts for all these different kinds of horns. And for this horn number three and horn number four, which are the hyperbolic horn and the exponential horn, this is what quantum mechanics does. This is reflective of, of quantum mechanics. So there's some very deep issues here, which I, this is this shows you the formula for the eigenfunctions of the exponential horn. It's a constant coefficient equation. It's just trivial to show. And it shows that when the frequency goes below a cutoff frequency, the real part of the impedance goes to zero. And bingo, you're in the realm of quantum mechanics. And oh. so I must stop there because I'm 22 minutes beyond my time. And thank you for listening. There's still 18 thank you. there, which is amazing. Started with 33 or something. 38, yep. Thank you. Um, you any other, I'm gonna stuff. turn the YouTube off, but if anybody else would like to ask some questions and linger a little longer, that'd be great. Did you, uh, oh, you can't even see me because I'm in the dark. Did, did you happen to record this?